Well, hello. Today would be July 22nd, 2019, and the purpose of this particular Zoom session, as I had mentioned in my email that I sent to all of you, the purpose here is a review for your upcoming final exam in this particular course. So, without any further ado, what I will do is look at Unit 1, Outer and Middle Ear Disorders, because that was the furthest away. Okay, That's, that, that stuff was early on in the semester and is most likely further back in your memories. The retrochochlear pathology, of course, was just last week and the week before, so that's more fresh in your memories. I'm looking at your exam now. I have a paper copy of it in front of me. Here, want to see it? There you go. Pretty good, huh? On your exam, what I have, and it may not be exactly like this, I'm not sure if Lynn Royer is putting exactly the same exam up on Canvas, but I imagine many of the questions will be exactly what I have here. The first, page, the first uh, items are true-false, and then there's multiple choice. And in my exam, what I have is about, uh, I have exactly 100 questions. I'm not sure what she's got uploaded for you, but anyway, let's just look at it, and we'll look at what, what uh, at unit one. So I will share screen now, and we'll look at unit one, outer and middle ear disorders. And I, you can see the units right here. Okay, we'll look at, it says unit two, but this is actually your unit one. I'll make it a little bit bigger. There you go. So looking at these terms here, you know, you should know the terms microtia, atresia, stenosis, okay? Those three, you should just basically have a handle on what those are. External otitis, just follow the words, external, outer, oto, ear, itis, inflammation or infection, okay? What you're seeing here is you should know what an osteoma is. It's a bony tumor in the ear canal. If we look at some pictures here, not sure if I've got this in your actual diagrams in this particular PowerPoint or not. I can always pull up stuff as well, but let's see what I got here. Here. All right, blow this guy up and make it bigger. There you go. Osteoma. Hey, osteoma, all right? Bony tumors in the ear canal often associated with what was called swimmer's ear, the body's reaction against cold, okay? So anyway, you can see, look at this little cone of light here. What ear do you think that is? Remember the orientation of the cone of light when you're looking in with a otoscope? It's five o'clock when you're looking at the right ear and it's seven o'clock when you're looking at the left ear. I would imagine this is the left ear then, just FYI. All right, so it's a, let's see, back to share screen here. Tympanic membrane perforations, well, you need to know what myringotomy is, myringoplasty, tympanoplasty. Every time you're seeing the word otomy or myringotomy, that's a hole or a puncture made in the eardrum by an ear, nose, and throat doctor in order to put in pressure equalizing tubes for recurrent middle ear infections. And of course, we all remember the, the name for middle ear infections, otitis media. Very good. All right. Tympanoplasty, myringoplasty. Every time you see the word plasty, that just means plastic surgery. Okay, surgery to, to repair stuff. You need to know what the term monomeric tympanic membrane is. A thin mono, one, okay. A thin tympanic membrane due to imperfect healing of perforations. Perhaps the middle layer of the eardrum. Remember how many layers your eardrum has? Three, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Ectoderm is skin lining continuing from the outer ear canal. Endoderm is the inner lining of tissue of the eardrum from the middle ear space, continuous covering the eardrum. And the middle layer is the arachnoid layer. It's the spider layer. It looks like spokes on a wheel, okay? It's the tough layer. And that layer may not have healed very well because of recurrent eardrum perforations due to bulging otitis media, which blew a hole in the eardrum. 
And so you've got an eardrum that's very, not very stiff. It's very overly compliant. Now here's something we got to take a look at too. Look where I'm going to be pointing you at audiometry. And audiometry, we need to really have a good grip of what I've grayed out here, okay? Audiometry, we kind of look at some of this in the course. I'm assuming that you've all had a, a smattering of audiometry. I haven't taught you, but we have very often in this course gone over the three components of the hearing test. Number one air conduction, pure tone air conduction testing, pure tone bone conduction testing. If there's a difference in your hearing thresholds with those two modes of testing, you've got a conductive hearing loss. The second portion, if there's no difference between the way you hear by air conduction with a headphone compared to the way you hear by bone conduction with an oscillator placed on the mastoid behind your ear, if there's no difference, you have a sensory neural hearing loss. Now, the second part is speech audiometry. And I'll stop sharing just for a second here. It's very important that we understand audiometry as it relates to the disorders. So if you are confused on this, write it down to make sure you internalize it. Otherwise, we're screwed because if audiometry results occur due to hearing disorders. So a difference in the way you heard by air conduction compared to the way you heard by bone conduction. If you're hearing by bone conduction is better than the way you hear by air conduction, obviously you have something blocking the passage of sound. Earwax otitis media, something is physically and mechanically blocking sound from getting through until you make it loud enough so the sound can get through, okay? So you'll have a hearing loss by air conduction, by bone conduction, you are bypassing the outer ear, and you are bypassing the middle ear. So by bone conduction, if you're hearing like a baby, and by air conduction, you have a hearing loss, you have a conductive hearing loss. You're blocking the conduction of sound getting to where it's got to go. Conductive hearing loss is the kind of hearing loss you want to have because it can be fixed. Trouble is, only 5% of hearing loss in the world is conductive. All the rest is sensory neural. And if your hearing loss is sensory neural, you can do nothing about it except have understanding loved ones and hearing aids. So, the second portion of the hearing test is speech audiometry. And the first portion of speech audiometry, you can call this letter 2A, okay, Spe most comfortable loudness. In other words, 2 being speech audiometry, the first test is MCL, most comfortable loudness. In the ear, what sounded comfortably loud, not too loud, not too soft, speech. You're talking. How do I sound now? If I, was a, if I was a radio, would you turn me up or down in this ear? Do I sound comfortable? Just like Goldilocks. Just right. That's your MCL. Number two, speech B, is speech reception threshold. At MCL, you're reading two-syllable words, spondy words, hardware, cupcake, armchair, birthday, cowboy. Two syllable words with even emphasis on both syllables, and they're made up of two little words. Meatball, okay? Ice cream. Now, you read words at MCL. Can the guy repeat them back? Go down 10 dB. Can the guy repeat them back? Go down 10 dB. Can you repeat them back? Go down 10 dB. Can you repeat them back? Nope. Go up 5 dB. Can you repeat them back? Yep, good. There you go, speech reception threshold. You're testing hearing thresholds by air conduction, not by bone, but by air conduction, only this time without speech, without using pure tones, you're using speech. And the level at which the person can just barely hear the speech, the softest he can hear the speech, is called SRT, speech reception threshold, and that must M-U-S-T, must agree with the softest that the person could hear the pure tones. At what frequencies? Five, 1,000, 
and 2,000. Add up the hearing thresholds it took to just barely hear those three frequencies. Add them up, divide by three. That's the pure tone average. And PTA needs to agree with SRT. If they don't, either your instructions are unclear and you don't know what you're doing, or your equipment is out of calibration, or the guy's lying. Pseudo hypocusis, faking it. Okay, so this is a tool we have, a to check the validity of our pure tones of our pure tone testing that we did by air conduction. Okay, we want to find out were those really good thresholds? Were they true? Because did speech agree with that? All right, if not, you're gonna to have to redo your pure tone thresholds or something's wrong. Now. The third part of speech testing, speech discrimination. You're going back to the person's MCL and you're not making the words softer. Now you're gonna leave the words alone, okay? And you're gonna say single syllable words. And the guy can't see you again, just with SRT, the same thing. The guy, you either played them on a CD and the person couldn't see, or you covered your face and you read them aloud, okay? Through the microphone into the guy's headphones. Either way. now. So now you're doing speech discrimination. And these words don't get any softer. Say the word cow. Say the word tool. Say the word see. Say the word life. Say the word deaf. Ooh, did you say deaf or deaf? Say, couldn't see the, the clarity of the hearing. You're testing the clarity of the hearing. You're not going down, down, down anymore. It's the clarity. And the fourth part of speech testing, uncomfortable loudness level. You're raising up the loudness of your voice until the guy can't stand it anymore. The third part of the, of the hearing test is tympanometry. And tympanometry is non-behavioral. Remember? Involuntary. And it's, it has subsections too, just like the speech test did. Okay? Type of tympanogram, type A, B, C, or type AS, or type AD. Those are the five types. Look at them in your notes. Be very careful to know what they are. And then the next part of the tympanometer, tympanometry is, what's the height of the tympanogram? Static compliance. That would be 3B, okay? Because 3 is tympanometry. The 3A is type of tymp, A, B, C, whatever. 3B would be, the height of the tympanogram, static compliance. 3C would be physical volume of air in the ear canal. If the guy's got a hole in the eardrum, the probe tip is gonna read the volume of air outside of the eardrum as well as the volume of air inside or behind the drum because there's a hole. What's a normal physical volume? One to one and a half cubic centimeters. One to one and a half cubic centimeters, about the size of a sugar cube, is the air volume behind the tip of the tympanogram or the tympanometer and your eardrum. If it's way bigger than that, you got a hole in the drum. If it's way smaller than that, maybe the tip is jammed up against the side of the ear canal. And 3D, acoustic reflexes. Acoustic reflexes. Now, back to sharing screen and look at audiometry regarding outer ear disorders. Outer ear disorders can result in very mild conductive hearing loss. Lots of outer ear disorders don't even have an associated hearing loss, like osteoma. Doesn't have. As long as you can see the eardrum, no problem. Even wax, as long as you can see behind the wax, if there's a hole in the wax, no hearing loss, okay? So lots of outer ear disorders don't have much hearing loss. They will have air conduction and bone conduction will be normal. Tympanometry will be normal. You know, everything will be quite normal. Speech audiometry will be normal, okay? Good. Audiometric results after eardrum surgery may be a little bit different. You may have a type AD tympanogram, your, your static compliance, the height of your tympanogram will be abnormally large. It says here, watch out for collapsing ear canals. In the elderly, people are losing cartilage. 
And so if you're using circumoral headphones, the round ones outside the ear, the pressure against your ear might fold or collapse your ear canal. And then you'll get a, a hearing loss. What kind? Usually a high frequency conductive hearing loss. In English, that means the hearing by air conduction will be better or will be worse, I should say, than the hearing by bone conduction for the high frequencies, like 2,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz. Air bone gaps usually begin, and I'll just let you see my face here again, air bone gap, memorize that term. It's very important in audiometry. It's the difference between the way you heard by air conduction or bone. If you have no air bone gap, you have either normal hearing or sensory neural hearing loss. If you have an air bone gap, you have a conductive hearing loss. Now, air bone gaps, a difference between the way you heard by air and bone, they usually begin in the low frequencies. And as the otitis media gets worse and worse, the air bone gap begins to be consistent across all frequencies from 250 hertz to 8,000 hertz. But if you have an air bone gap only in the high frequencies, that's really weird. That, that's, that's unusual. That's weird okay and that would be a collapsed ear canal or maybe something's off in your calibration but whatever let's share a screen and move on otitis media the big one this is the main middle ear infection so now we're moving to middle ear infections memorize this and now look at the stages it's the stages of otitis media that we need to know okay first of all sore throat. So your tonsils are swollen. Your station tubes no longer open when you swallow. Remember, your eustachian tubes connect the back of your throat to your middle ears. And if they are, they are, they are normally closed and they open when you yawn and they open when you chew sometimes and they open when you swallow sometimes, okay, naturally to let new air in because your middle ear lining is always absorbing oxygen. The middle ear, the, the tissue lining the middle ear space always is absorbing oxygen. And you need to get the eustachian tubes open once in a while to let new air in. If you have sore throat and swollen tonsils, that cannot happen anymore. No new air gets in. And what are you getting now? A vacuum in the middle ear space. So your eardrum is sucked inward. Now, what kind of audiogram, what audiometry will you expect? Hearing loss by, the air, by air conduction. No hearing loss by bone conduction. What kind of speech testing will you find? You'll find your SRTs agree with your pure tone average if the person's telling the truth and God's in his heaven and all's well with the world. You will find MCLs will be elevated because you've got a, a hearing loss, so your MCL will be louder than normal. You, your speech discrimination will be fantastic at MCL, 100%, okay? Because there's nothing wrong with the inner ear hair cells. Remember, conductive hearing loss is simply like a plug in the ear. And if you're wearing earplugs, you're gonna have a hearing loss by air conduction and you're doing that on purpose. But you're, you're, once the sound is loud enough, you'll hear just fine through the earplugs, right? Just follow common sense. And the, your speech clarity at elevated loudness levels will be 100%. And your uncomfortable loudness levels will be elevated higher than normal. Why? Because you got your plug in your ears. Okay, so if you've got a vacuum behind your eardrum, let's move to the third part of the hearing test. You will have a negative tympanogram. You'll have a tympanogram with a normal peak, but it will be over negative air pressure. Your tympanograms will be over negative air pressure. If this is normal air pressure, positive air pressure, negative air pressure, remember what your middle ear does. Let's just look at each other and make sure we know this. Your middle ear, the eardrum, malleus, incus, and stapes. Those four things, eardrum, malleus, incus, and stapes. Think of them as a unit. They're all together. They work as a unit. Now, that unit 
is going to work best at passing sound through it when the air pressure is even, steven on both sides of the drum. If the eardrum is my nose, <laughs> okay, my face ear, or whatever, my eardrum, if the air pressure on either side is even, the middle ear works the best. Remember, the middle ear is a stiffness-dominated system. It's always stiff, but it's least stiff when air pressure is even. Now pretend over here there's negative air pressure behind the drum. I'm going to have to use negative air pressure outside the drum with the probe to make the air pressure even so that the negative air pressure on this side of the drum is even with the negative air pressure on this side of the drum. And then my air pressures are even, steven on both sides of the drum. So the tympanogram peak will be found over negative air pressure because most of the sound could get through when I made the air pressure negative in the ear canal to counteract the negative air pressure behind the drum. So when the negative was equal to the negative, I've made the air, the air pressure even steven on both sides of the drum, and at that air pressure in the ear canal negative was most of the sound ready to pass through the middle ear system. So my peak will be over negative air pressure. The peak being most sound getting through, the tails of the tent, less sound getting through, all right, your tympanogram will be a type C. With negative air pressure behind the drum, early otitis media, you'll have a type C tympanogram. Now let's move to the next stage, serous otitis media. S-E-R-O-U-S, serous otitis media. Now your middle ear has rebelled, and now it's making fluid. And the fluid is filling the middle ear space, and it's clear, it's uninfected. You can almost see it like bubbles behind the drum. It's like water. It's like the fluid under a blister. It's clear. It's not infected yet. And now your ear, middle ear, your eardrum is, now it's bulged. And now when you're changing air pressure with your tympanometer in, the, in, your, in your ear canal, and you've got that probe airtight stuck in your ear canal, you're making the air pressure positive, and you're making it normal, and you're making it negative in the, in the ear canal, and no sounds getting through that middle ear at all. Because you know what? Changes in air pressure in the ear canal cannot compete with fluid bulged behind the drum. So you will have a flat tympanogram. No peak at any air pressure. A type B. So you can see how A, B, and C tympanograms can be used to track the progress of otitis media. So more advanced otitis media, type B tympanogram. Early otitis media, type C tympanogram. Very good. So the terms, let's share screen once again. Going to our notes, serous otitis media. And then the next stage, separative. Okay, separative. You might see the term purulent. Okay, either one, same kind of thing. Okay, separative refers to something causing the production of pus. Purulent is the pus itself. Pus means light. Okay, the fluid has now become infected. Now it's white. Okay, like the, sorry to gross you out, but like the, like the stuff that's in a pimple, it's white. And it hurts. And it's a advanced otitis media as well. Serous and suppurative are both associated with bulging eardrums. We rarely have stage four today and stage five today because we've got antibiotics and medical treatment. But if the middle ear infection is left alone untreated, it could turn into mastoiditis, inflammation and infection of the porous mastoid bone itself that surrounds the middle ear space. Or remember the roof of the middle ear space is only an eighth of an inch from the base of the brain. And if that gets infected, you've got meningitis. Okay, so stages four and five rarely occur today. Usually things go from stage one, two to three. The treatments for otitis media, of course, 
You should know these three. Put a star by that. Move on. Audiometry and otitis media, there you go. It's right there in front of you. Okay? If you have questions, be sure to email me. Nobody's here in this Zoom session. I always wish people would because then you can ask me questions and then you are driving the review instead of me. But nonetheless, carry on. Tympanometry results. You should put a star by this one, patulous or patent eustachian tubes. Know what those are. Cholesteatoma. You should have a basic idea of what that is. It's when the eardrum has a perforation near the edge. And when you've got a perforation near the edge of the eardrum that doesn't heal very well due to rampant otitis media, the skin may try to heal itself in a feverish tizzy, and the cells go crazy. And when the cells go crazy, they turn cancerous, okay? And it's usually benign, can be malignant, but usually benign. What's the difference between benign and malignant? Benign means that the tumor is like a little round ball, like a little pearl, like a little sack, and it's isolated, like a little egg if it got big. Okay, and you can take it out because it's isolated. It's not really invading the tissues around it. Malignant means that the, that the tumor actually is going through the tissue, you know. Instead of being surrounded and encased by healthy tissue, this is the tumor and this is the, the skin around it, okay. That it's kind of gotten through and it's invading and it spreads. And then it can go to other areas of the body, can travel to the lungs, can travel to the kidney or pancreas or God knows, okay? That's essentially the difference. That's why benign tumors are kinder. They can be treated. You can take them out. Cholesteatoma can be treated and often taken out, okay? So it's usually a benign tumor. Share a screen. All right, and if you've got a cholesteatoma, it invades the middle ear space fast. It's when cells from the outside of the ear, eardrum now are migrating toward the inside, toward, toward behind the drum, and it, they build up fast behind your eardrum, and that's never a good thing. All right, Bell's palsy, you need to know that that's just damage to the seventh facial nerve. It's your cheek, your cheek muscles that make you smile. And if you've got, the reason why you can have damage to the seventh facial nerve is if you have retrochochlear pathology, okay, and I don't know why this sentence is in outer ear, but just put a star by this. If you had retrochochlear pathology of the eighth nerve, what nerve travels right alongside of the eighth nerve through the internal auditory meatus? I'll share, stop sharing. Let's look at external and internal auditory meatus. External auditory meatus, your ear canal. Internal auditory meatus means the tunnel through the bone from your cochlea to your brainstem. It's about an inch long. Okay, so the distance from the cochlea to your brainstem is about an inch. And the tunnel of bone that those that the eighth nerve courses through and that the seventh nerve courses through is the internal auditory meatus. So if you have an eighth nerve tumor, it's going to squeeze on the seventh facial nerve as well. And eighth nerve tumors are also usually benign, okay? They're not malignant. They can be removed. Often, though, the removal of an eighth nerve tumor involves going through the cochlea, making the ear deaf, of course, so that ear may be deaf, but they can still get the tumor out, okay? But the seventh facial nerve might be damaged, too, and then, you know, you've got facial paralysis. Bell's palsy. One side of the face is paralyzed due to a damaged seventh facial nerve. Share screen. Then we move to otosclerosis, and otosclerosis is a different pathology of the, of the outer ear, I mean of the middle ear. 
So looking here, otosclerosis, otosclerosis. Here's a common audiogram with otitis media. It's good to have this. Look at your PowerPoint slides as well. I'll move this out of the way though. These, of course, are the way the person heard by bone conduction. Very good. Very few decibels were required. By air conduction, the right ear and left ear had a hearing loss. Notice how the hearing gets a little better at 2,000 hertz. That's because the resonance of the middle ear ossicles is 2,000 hertz. Okay. Anyway, myringotomy, tympanopore, you're sticking a tube inside the person's ear. Cone of light in the right ear, cone of light in the left ear, pressure equalizing tube, children in otitis media, you should know why they get it more than adults. It's because the eustachian tube in children is flatter. Okay, we've got the force of gravity working our way as adults. So infection more easily crawls up a child's eustachian tubes. Their skulls are squatter, not as long. Here's a child in eustachian tube going up to his middle ear. In an adult, it's more vertical. Okay. Tympanic membrane, you know it's the right ear because the cone of light is at five o'clock. Right ear tympanic membrane, retracted eardrum, type C tympanogram, bulged seroosotitis media, type B tympanogram, suppurative otitis media. Bulged type, again, type B tympanogram. Again, again. Pressure equalizing tube. The middle ear you learned in anatomy makes up some 30 to 35 dB. Why can a conductive loss be often greater than 30 to 35 dB? And it can. With circumoral headphones, it can be 60 dB. The airbone gap can be 60. In other words, let's make sure we got this. I'll go back some slides and look at the uh, audiogram. The hearing loss here is about 40 or 50. With circumoral headphones, the hearing loss can be about 60. The airbone gap, the difference by, by, between air conduction and bone, can be as much as 60. With insert headphones, it can be even greater. Okay, anyway, if the middle ear, as you learned in anatomy, makes up or adds about 20, 30 to 35 dB to incoming sound, why can a conductive loss be greater than 30 to 35 dB? That's what this question here is asking you. That's because normally sound is hitting the eardrum, which pushes on the malleus incus and stapes and pushes into the oval window. Okay, and makes a traveling wave in the cochlea. But if you've got a problem that causes the oval and round windows to be hit at the same time, you're going to have a greater than 30 to 35 dB conductive hearing loss. And what causes that? Well, if you had no eardrum and no middle ear ossicles, like is shown here, or if you had this, or this, or this, or this, because the fluid is filling the entire middle ear space and there is no interaction. There isn't that pushing back and forward of stapes into oval window and oval window bulging out or a round window bulging out. There isn't that round window, oval window interaction, interplay. So if you've lost that interplay because of fluid in the middle ear space, you won't have that. Okay, because the fluid is preventing that interplay of happening. So your conductive hearing loss can be greater than the 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear is making up. Share screen. Move on. We get to otitis media, or I should say, uh, here's your type of tympanograms. So it's good that you, that you take a look at that. Now let's look at... We saw this, and you can always look at these slides on your own, okay? Disarticulated ossicles. Look at that. The, 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 the incus is no, no longer attached to the stapes. So you're going to have, what, what's, what are you going to have there? You're going to have a huge type A tympanogram, but it's going to be larger than usual, okay? You have hyper compliance. 
very little stiffness. Or if you have a monomeric eardrum, okay. Disarticulated ossicles, you're not going to have a very stiff middle ear system. You're going to have a type AD tympanogram, overly tall. Type AD, overly tall, not, not normal like a type A. Physical volume of ear canal. Here's all these slides talking about tympanometry. Be sure you look at them and it'll help you understand what audiometry is associated with various pathologies. My ringotomy tubes. Here's otosclerosis. Now, otosclerosis is different. Otosclerosis. Let's see if we got a picture of it. Here, look at the picture. A porous growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes. No change in air pressure. Doesn't air pressure is normal here? There's no middle ear infection. This is completely hereditary. And it usually happens in young adulthood, not as a child. You just are born, you're going to get it because mom or dad had it. Okay. And look at the soft, porous growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes. What happens here now is that the foot plate of the stapes cannot push in and out of the oval window very well. So they often do what's called a stapedectomy. They take out the stapes, they put in a piece of fat with a metal prosthesis, stapedectomy, okay, is the surgical treatment for otosclerosis. And what, here's the prep, these are just pictures for your own interest showing you the stages of doing a stapedectomy. So you can look at that for yourself. Look at the audiogram associated with otosclerosis, or the audiogram here, mine, or this picture out of a textbook. Mine, picture out of a textbook. What are you noticing that's similar between these two? Bone conduction is going down and then back up again. And it's going down at 2,000 hertz only. So normal bone conduction, and then a little bit of bone conduction hearing loss, and then a little better again. Air conduction shows a flat conductive hearing loss. Recall conductive hearing losses are usually fairly flat because you're, the blockage of sound is similar across the frequencies. That's what happens when you put a plug in your ear. Okay, so otosclerosis is a plug in the ear caused by the porous bone growing around the foot plate of the stapes. <coughs> Why do you get this notch? And this is called Carhartt's notch. Carhartt was the founder of the field of audiology. He taught at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Anyway, it's the drop in bone conduction thresholds that indicates to you, the clinician, that the pathology or the disorder of the middle ear is probably otosclerosis, not otitis media. And why the notch in the bone? Well, let's look at that. Why the notch in the bone? So let's go to our unit here and make sure we understand what these are. In your readings here, there you go, right there. Bone conduction. For ourselves to achieve bone conduction hearing, the way we hear by bone conduction is caused by three different things, osseotympanic bone conduction, inertial bone conduction, and distortional bone conduction. Let's stop sharing and let me just talk to you. When you have the bone oscillator on the mastoid bone and you're vibrating by presenting sound, tones, you're wiggling the fluids inside the, the uh, cochlea and you're causing traveling waves in the cochlea and the person's going to hear you. Distortional bone conduction. That's the big contribution. The second contribution, think of this one as a, a, like a mouse on top of the elephant, okay, a little contribution is called inertial, and it means that the middle ear ossicles are not attached to the skull except by ligaments, right? The middle ear system is, is all attached. You've got the eardrum, malleus, inca, stapes, and they work as a unit, 
But are they completely fused to the skull? No, not really. They're attached to the skull by ligaments. And the oval window sitting in, I mean, the, the footplate of the stapes is sitting in the oval window. And the eardrum, yeah, it's attached to the ear canal by the annulus or whatever, you know, it's, it's in there. But they're not fused to the skull. But if you've got otosclerosis, they are fused to the skull because the soft, porous growth of bone around the foot plate of the stapes has now frozen the, the whole ossicular chain, the unit, and now it is attached to the skull. So when you're doing zzz, zzz by distortional bone conduction, the whole middle ear system is moving right along with the skull. So you no longer have the inertial bone conduction. Inertial bone conduction is what happens when your middle ear system is normal. So when you're going zzz, zzz, presenting the tone through distortional bone conduction, the middle ear bones are lagging a little bit because they're attached to the skull only by ligaments. So they're la they, they'll move, but they're moving a little bit behind. And that's called inertial bone conduction. They're pushing the, the stapes in and out of the oval window a little bit. And that tends to improve your bone conduction. The third contribution is osseotympanic. When I'm zzz, zzz, vibrating the skull, there's a tiny little column of air moving in the outer ear canal. And that tiny little column of air is pushing against the eardrum. And it's pushing against the ossicles, pushing the stapes in and out of the oval window. But when you have otosclerosis, that can't happen either because the whole middle ear system is frozen in place. So that little column of air moving in and out of the ear canal when I'm doing zzz, zzz, isn't giving you that little other contribution of osseotympanic. So if you only have distortional and you've nixed out inertial and you've nixed out osseotympanic, you're going to have a little bit of a drop in bone conduction. And that drop will occur at the resonance of the middle ear ossicles which is 2,000 hertz. That's why you will have a little bit of a drop in hearing sensitivity across 2,000 hertz. And it does not repeat, not refer to hair cell damage at 2,000 hertz. It is not a sensory neural loss. It's an artifact. It's just BS. It's just an artifact caused by the interaction of the way we test bone conduction, and the unique pathology that is otosclerosis. The way we test bone conduction and the unique pathology or disorder of, of otosclerosis, those two married together give you the child of Carhartt's notch. But it is not a real thing. As clinicians, we need to know that it exists, and that's a sign Okay, it's a sign of otosclerosis. You, you're seeing this. And because you went to OTC and you learned a little bit about the whys of things, you're going to go, huh, that looks like otosclerosis. Huh. And you, did your mom have hearing loss when you, when you were, yeah, yeah, she got it, she said in her 20s or 30s, yeah. I'm going to send you to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. I want you to get, a, I want the, the person to take a look at this. They can fix it, you know. Some people decide not to get otosclerosis fixed. Some people just decide to wear hearing aids, period. Let's move on and share screen and move on to inner ear disorders. Quick a sec. Let's review. We're reviewing here. Now let's look at inner ear disorders. And this was a little bit more recent, so we can spend a little less time on it. I want to highlight for you what you should know. Okay, put a star by sensory and put a star by neural. And always know that there's two types of sensory neural hearing loss. One's damage to the outer hair cells, one is damage to the inner hair cells. And realize that damage to the outer hair cells tends to occur earlier than damage to the inner hair cells. Okay, Dam outer hair cell pathology will give you about a 30 to 40 to 50 to maybe 60 dB sensory neural loss. But if your sensory neural loss is 70 or 80 dB, then you know that inner hair cells are involved. Outer hair cells help inner hair cells by helping them pick up sounds below 50 or 60 dB. 
So if you have damaged outer hair cells completely, you'll have a 50 to 60 dB sensory neural loss. If your hearing loss is greater than 50 or 60, you know that the inners are now involved as well. Remember the differences. Outer hair cells take sounds from or help take messages from the brain, and they stretch and shrink, helping the inner hair cells pick up soft sounds below 50 or 60. Inner hair cells send info to the brain. So inner hair cells are afferent, outer hair cells are efferent. It's a two-way street. So inner hair cells send info to the brain. When they are damaged, you are going to have very poor speech discrimination. The speech audiometry, okay, your MCLs will be elevated. <clears throat> your speech reception thresholds will be elevated, of course. They'll agree with the pure tone averages as we've described. But you're going to have poor speech discrimination, especially with neural sensory neural loss. Hereditary causes, well, don't freak too much about this at all, okay? Don't worry about genes and dominant genes, this whole section here, leave it alone. You need to know what the word rubella is, German measles, put a star by that and read it. Perinatal, you need to know the, what, the, what the word means, okay? The one would be anoxia, trauma during birth. Postnatal causes is the most common. A person might get meningitis. Well, that'd be terrible. That'll cause deafness. Measles might cause a hearing loss, sensory neural. It can. Mumps can cause a sensory neural hearing loss. An infection of the cochlea can cause a sensory neural hearing loss. Ototoxicity. Know this term. Aminoglycosides. Be able to spell it. It's, a, it's, the, it's, it's an antibiotic. These are antibiotics that end in the term mycin. So look at what it's grayed out there, mycin. Those are ototoxic antibiotics. They may help the person fight a disease, but they may cause permanent damage to the vestibular system or cochlear hair cells. Ototoxicity. You have two types of medications that many people take that are exceptions here. Aspirin, of course, is not an antibiotic, but it can cause tinnitus. Remember that. Put a star by that. Erythromycin is an, is an antibiotic that ends in mycin, but it is not ototoxic. Okay, so know that. Moving on to presbycusis. This is a very good fact to memorize, right there. Have that sucker memorized. It's on the final, okay? Uh, and then here's your types of presbycusis. Know the name Schucknecht and the four types of presbycusis. Gender effects and presbycusis. Males usually show a steeper sensory neural loss with better hearing in the lows and worse in the highs. Women <clears throat> might show usually, not always, these are generalizations, but a flatter hearing loss than elderly men. Slightly worse hearing in the lows, but better hearing in the highs. And for the reasons that you're reading right there. As always, when we're studying for these things, always study things in chunks. Okay, the bold faced headings, and then the, the, the unbold stuff underneath it always refers to the bold-faced heading above it. When you eat, you eat in forkfuls. We don't take the whole plate and jam it in our face. Okay? So read these things, these notes in chunks. It's the best way to do it. Noise-induced hearing loss is the second most common cause of hearing loss. The sad thing about it is that it's preventable. Put a star by this. You need to know what what is what is the uh, what what are, what causes noise-induced hearing loss. It's the intensity above 85 dB, and it's also the time that you're exposed to it. And the shape of noise-induced hearing loss. The shape of it. Very interesting. So lots of this PowerPoint under inner ear disorders covers hair cells in general. It's like a review of your audiometry. I mean, of your anatomy. Here's the audiogram associated with typical presbycusis. It slopes down. 
And notice how the bone conduction goes right along with the air conduction. It doesn't, it's not flat, it slopes down. That's the most common hearing loss in the world. Typical presbycusis. Sensory, usually mild to moderate. Mild to moderate. Sensory presbycusis. These are kind of, uh, you, uh, just leave that alone. I, I went over it, but we have no time. Now you're looking at, uh, oh, let's look at noise-induced hearing loss. So here's the most common presbycusis. And I gave you this here. Let's do this together, just for the heck of it. <clears throat> you've done the air conduction. You've done bone conduction. What would you, MCLs, what would they be here for the right ear and the left ear? Well, MCLs would probably be around, I don't know, 70. What's the, what's the loudness that this, what's the loudest that this person could tolerate? Let's look at UCL, uncomfortable loudness. What do you think it would be? Probably about 100. Because he doesn't have a plug in his ear. There's nothing wrong with his eardrum. There's nothing wrong with his middle ear. <clears throat> There's no <clears throat> otosclerosis. There's no otitis media. So guess what? His uncomfortable loudness level is going to be the same as yours and mine. The thing about sensory neural hearing loss is that loudness tolerance is the same as it is for normal hearing people. Okay, <clears throat> the ceiling of one's loudness tolerance will be the same. If you go up to someone who's deaf and yell in his ear, he's going to wind up and punch you in the head. Okay, it's going to hurt that person exactly like it hurts you and me. So his loudness tolerance ceiling hasn't changed. What's going to change is his floor. He can't hear until he's standing on the table. Okay, he can't hear down to zero. It takes about 50 to just barely hear. And yet 100 sounds too loud. So the uncomfortable loudness level is going to be around 100. If the hearing levels, if the pure tone average is around 50, the SRT is going to agree with pure tone average is going to be around 50. His speech discrimination, or his MCL, I'm going to say, will be about halfway in between. What's halfway between 50 and 100? 75. So let's look at the audiogram again. It'll be about 75, right around here. <clears throat> What's his speech discrimination? SD1? Speech discrimination? Probably pretty good. Around 80%. Not bad. Can't complain. You know, say the word cow. Say the word tree. Say the word moo. <laughs> okay, the person will get about 80% of the words you're saying. Not bad, you know. MCL will be about... 75, speech discrimination. Uh, there's SD2 here because some people do speech discrimination a second time. They might do it a little bit louder and see if the person gets better, you know. Anyway, what type of tympanograms? Type A. Nothing wrong with the middle ears. What about acoustic reflexes? They'll be present. Don't worry about ipsy contrary, just leave it. They'll be, they'll be present. Okay. Let's look at noise-induced loss. There's the shape. Yep. Here's the shape of it. Second most common cause of, sen of sensory neural loss in the world. And why does it have that shape? It has the shape it does because of your outer ear canal resonance. Your outer ear canals resonate around 1,000 to between 1,500 and 4,000 hertz. And the peak is around 2,700 hertz. And noise-induced hearing loss is associated with something called the half-octave shift. And the half-octave shift means most broadband noises, most industrial noises are broadband. They're, they're, they're fat. They'll, be, they'll cover a whole, whole range of frequencies. But that range of frequencies is coming into your outer ear canal, and your outer ear canal is favoring these frequencies. So if you have a wide band of noise meeting this, it's going to be these that are elevated a little bit more because of your outer ear canal resonance. So your external auditory meatus resonance creates a band pass noise. In other words, favors this. And that's centered around 3,000 hertz. It's centered around 3,000 hertz. 
And basilar membrane, the floor upon which your hair cells all stand, that floor, that ripple with the traveling wave happens to be biggest about a half an octave higher than the frequencies of the stimulus. So it's your, the basilar membrane, the way the floor of the hair cells moves is going to be bigger, biggest, about a half an octave higher than right here. So take this bump, shift it a half an octave higher, and what are you going to get? This. So this is this shifted a half an octave to the right and flipped upside down. There you go. The half octave shift, noise-induced hearing loss. There you go. Here's various studies that looked at decibels and as the noise is increased by 5 dB, the threshold shift gets most, most pronounced. Don't in confuse that with half octave shift. Just how much did it damage the hearing levels, period. That's what they mean by threshold shift, okay? How much more damage to the hearing levels occurred, that's all. Some states say that 90 is the level. Other states say 85 is the level. But notice how when you go up in intensity, the allowed time of exposure generally is decreased. In my general rules, usually what I put on a test is, if you're getting sounds at 85 dB, you're allowed eight hours exposure. If it gets to be 90 dB, you're allowed four. If, and just do the math. If you're going 95, it's two hours and so on. But I'll always mention it, what we're starting at if it's ever on an exam. Okay, another pathology of the, of the inner ear is Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease, usually worse hearing in the lows and it gets better toward the highs. And the reason this orange thing here is drawn on top of the audiogram is just to tell you we've unrolled the cochlea. And notice how the, the basilar membrane, I'm going to get myself out of the way here, the basilar membrane, the floor upon which the hair cells stand, is narrowest at the widest base of the cochlea and gets wider as you go toward the narrow tip of the cochlea, exactly backward to what you'd think. So here, you've got one row of inner hair cells all along, and you might have three rows of outers, four rows of outers, five rows of outers here, and the walls, Okay, the basilar membrane follow my cursor and Reissner's membrane follow my cursor. Okay, those walls of the scala media where the hair cells are all existing, the walls in the cochlea that separate endolymph from perilymph, those walls are the least stiff at the apex of the cochlea and there's more mass at the apex of the cochlea. This, look, this is wider, <laughs> okay? We'll just pretend this is the basilar membrane, this whole orange thing. And if we ever went home here, looking at it here, you're looking at it now. Here's looking at you, kid. You got Reissner's membrane, basilar membrane. At the apex of the cochlea, there are five rows of outer hair cells, and the basilar membrane is longer. This whole triangular shape is longer as you get to the narrow apex of the cochlea, okay? And the walls are less stiff. There's more mass and less stiffness. And what is Meniere's disease? Too much endolymph inside the scala media. So now the walls are bulging. Reissner's membrane is bulging. Basilar membrane is bulging. Those who indulge, bulge, okay? And if they are bulging, well, now let's go and look at our, let's look at our, uh, <clears throat> at, at, at our Meniere slide again here. Okay? 
If you're jamming too much fluid into this orange area here, where are the walls going to bulge? Where are they less stiff? Right here and right here. Less stiffness, more mass. More stiffness, less mass. So the walls will bulge at the apex of the cochlea, causing hair cell dysfunction, and your hearing loss will be greater in the lows than in the highs. This is called a rising or a reverse hearing loss. Not nearly so common as the precipitous hearing loss caused by noise-induced hearing loss. Here's a precipitous hearing loss, or the gently sloping hearing loss caused by presbycusis. So the main three pathologies of the inner ear, presbycusis, noise-induced hearing loss, Meniere's disease, ototoxicity can cause damage anywhere, usually mostly in the highs, ototoxicity, and that's a fourth pathology or disorder of the inner ear. So, looking where we are now to finish off our Zoom session this morning, because I really won't bother much with retrocochlear pathology because that was so new. Okay? But here we move on through sudden idiopathic deafness. You should have an idea that this is pretty rare, and it's usually one ear. And why does it happen? We don't know. That's why it's called idiopathic. Like idiots, we don't know the reason why. Okay, Meniere's disease, we often don't know why the person got it. Noise induced, we do. Noise. Presbycusis, we do, because the person got better like wine with age. Okay, Meniere's disease, head trauma, cochlear dead regions. When you're looking at cochlear dead regions, that's just total deafness in some area of the cochlea, total hair cell damage. Now, here's what we need to know about cochlear dead regions. Let's move on down here. Here's a cochlear dead region. Okay, look at all the, the eighth nerve fibers are all normal toward the apex of the cochlea, and in this case, complete hair cell and eighth nerve damage here. Okay, a dead region. So when you're understanding cochlear dead regions, it's helpful to look at the shape of traveling waves. They're always asymmetrical. They're shaped like kites. Okay, here's a low frequency traveling wave. It's exciting hair cells on the basilar membrane right here. So it's making this white basilar membrane ripple. There's your traveling wave. And of course, the outer hair cells, we said, sharpen and amplify the traveling waves. Well, a low frequency sound is going to cause a hair cell stimulation here, and a high frequency sound is going to cause a shorter traveling wave with a peak here. Okay, now, but they're always asymmetrical. In other words, the front always faces the apex. It always faces north, and the shallow slope always slopes toward the base. Upward spread of masking. A loud low frequency sound can cover a soft high frequency sound. The rumble of a truck outside will cover the peeping of a canary, but it doesn't work the other way around. A loud peeping of a canary will not cover the rumble of a truck. Why? Because of the shapes of the waves. So, cochlear dead regions. Let's say if all your hair cells below 1,000 hertz were damaged. If I make a low frequency sound loud enough in a headphone, it's going to create a big traveling wave in the low frequency region. Look what I did here again. I simply laid the basilar membrane across the top of the audiogram, just like you saw with Meniere's disease. And I'm just showing you a slightly different way here. I'm making a big traveling wave in the dead region. But look at, so the front of the wave always faces the apex. The tail, however, excites the mid frequencies, which are still healthy. And you're going to raise your hand. You are hearing these frequencies, okay, I should say you're hearing these, look where my cursor is, you're hearing these frequencies with hair cells that aren't meant to hear those frequencies. 
So the sound is going to be bizarre, okay? But it's going to look like you have only a moderate rising hearing loss. You might think the person has Meniere's disease. But if the person isn't reporting rotary vertigo, remember what the symptoms of Meniere's are, rotary vertigo, roaring tinnitus, and low frequency sensory neural loss, be sure to have those down. If the person isn't reporting those and has this, maybe it's genetic. Maybe the person inherited a low frequency dead area. But because of the physics, the way the inner ear works with its traveling waves that are asymmetrical, the hearing loss will look better than it is. Actually, these O's should be at the bottom until 1,000 hertz and then suddenly be up here. But the reason why the right ear in this case isn't at the bottom where my cursor is, okay, I hate it when that thing, the reason they're not here, okay, the reason they're up here is because of the shape of the traveling wave. Now with high frequency cochlear dead regions, now the loss looks a lot more like you think it would. If all your hair cells above a thousand hertz are totally dead, the audiogram is going to look more like what you'd expect. And the reason why, again, is the shape, S-H-A-P-E, the shape of your traveling waves. They're asymmetrical. Look, if I stimulate a high frequency, this thousand hertz, and you have a dead area here, okay, if I make the sounds this loud, maybe 35, it's enough so that the front of the wave is stimulating healthy hair cells. If I try to present 1500 hertz, it might take up to 60 decibels for you to hear it. But that's because the wave of the, the traveling wave peak may be in your dead area, but the front of it is still sticking into this living area. So you're hearing 1500 hertz with these hair cells. And if I go further into the heart of a Texas Saturday night, if I go further into your dead region, and I've got to make the sound really loud, I've got to make it like 90 in order so that the wave the front of the wave still sticks inside and can stimulate living hair cells. And that is why, W-H-Y, how come a high frequency dead region will render an audiogram that looks a lot more like what you'd expect than a low frequency dead region. All right, my fine feathered friends, let's look at what we can here retrocochlear pathology quickly know what these terms are know what central means what peripheral means is the eighth nerve part of the central nervous system is it part of the peripheral nervous system know what the incidence or the prevalence of eighth nerve tumors are about one in a hundred thousand Know that the eighth nerve is very short. It's about one inch long. All right. Know that it is usually unilateral. Occurring at a rate of about one in a hundred thousand. These are just handles, things you need to know. And you need to know what validity means, reliability, and then you need to know that retrocochlear pathology is the football playing field of tests. It's where tests are tested because eighth nerve pathology is harder or retrocochlear pathology is harder to detect. So because it's harder to detect, we need to apply the principles of true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. And basically the word sensitivity and specificity how good you can have a test that's 100% sensitive. That means it's going to have lots of true positives. It's going to catch everyone that has the disease, but by gum, it might catch some people that don't really have the disease. It will falsely identify them as having the disease. On the other hand, if a test is very specific, it may pass everyone that doesn't have the disease, but in all likelihood, if you've got a little tumor, it might let you go through too. 
So the trick is, so if you've got a highly specific test, you'll get lots of true negatives and also a lot of false negatives. Saying, no, you don't have the disease when actually you do. Okay? So have a handle and a grip on what those refer to. And when you're looking at the PowerPoint in that particular thing, have a grip on what we're looking at here. Sensitivity versus specificity. Okay, looking at that. Make it bigger. There you go. How this relates is exactly like it does to hearing a tone. If you've got normal hearing and the tone is only presented at 50 or it's left absent, every time the tone is present, you're going to say yes, true positives. Every tone, the time the tone is absent, you're going to say nope, I don't hear anything. You'll have all true positives, all true negatives. Look at that 50 now. What happens when it turns to 5? Now you're going to make mistakes. Sometimes when the tone is absent, you're going to pop up your hand and imagine you heard it, false positive. Sometimes when the tone is actually present, you may have heard it earlier another time, but this time you might have burped, you might have swallowed, you missed it, false negatives. So the top left and bottom right are true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. And that same principle carries into tests for eighth nerve tumors. Okay, it's the same concept. The disease is present and your test says, yep, you got the disease, true positive. The disease is absent and the test says, nope, you don't have the disease, true negative. Correct rejection. If, you, if, the, test, if the disease is absent but the test says you have the disease, false positive. If the disease is present and the test said, no, you didn't have the disease, false negative. So those are mistakes. So looking at tests. The best tests are non-behavioral, and they are going to be ABR, CAT scans, MRIs. The worst tests are behavioral, tone decay, terrible test. So read the notes, but don't freak, and we'll all be good. I think I'll stop sharing here. I'll shut my face, and this review is done. Bon chance, as they say in French. Good luck, as they say in English. I'm sure you'll do fine. I'm hoping the best for you. I hope you all come out of this course with straight A's. It would make not me look good. You'll shine a light on yourselves. So cheers. Hope it all works out for you. Sayonara. See you when we look at you. Live long and prosper. All right, stop recording now.